So, so still with um, the Haemophilia Centre at Blackburn, in terms of knowledge of risk and response to risk, um, the record suggests that Dr Newsom was not a regular attender at UK HCDO meetings. He was there in 77 and 78. He doesn't appear to have attended meetings in the 1980s. Um, however, there's no reason to think he wouldn't have received the copies of minutes um, uh, uh, of the meetings. Um, in his statement, he has said he can't remember how information from UK HCDO reached him, and he would have regarded its advice to be precisely that. In, in other words, to be advice. Um, th there's comparatively little contemporaneous documentation relating to hepatitis. Um, Dr Newsom has said in his statement it's very difficult for him to remember his knowledge of hepatitis risks at the start of his career in 1974, um, and he's unable to recall with accuracy how his knowledge developed over time, although he says in his statement that he did realise that hepatitis B could be a lethal infection. Um, he, he says in terms of relative risks, throughout my career I believe that products made by the National Blood Transfusion Service and its successors were relatively safe, but the concentrates, particularly of American origin, were not. As time went on, I began to realise that NBTS products were not as, as safe as I had believed, particularly with respect to hepatitis C. Um, he says he tried to, in order to reduce risks of hepatitis transmission, prioritise the use of NHS products. Um, and um, in an earlier statement he gave, which was in response to an, an individual witness statement, um, uh, um, a, a patient who, who was infected following an operation uh, in 1987, um, uh, he uh, said at that time, we knew at the time of the risk of infection from blood products that were pooled and which came from blood outside of the country, and that patients could get hepatitis from a transfusion of blood or blood products. There was a suspicion that American-derived factor eight could transmit blood-borne viruses. We were less concerned with domestic blood within the NHS. Dr. Newsom's not able to recall to what extent there was a discussion about with patients about the safety of cryoprecipitate. Um, he says he thinks he would have discussed the rationale for using cryoprecipitate with a patient, but not necessarily the risk of transmission of disease as cryo was deemed safe at the time. Um, in, in terms of knowledge of risk of HIV, again, um, as, as I said, he didn't attend UK HCDO meetings in the 80s, but we, um, um, uh, it may be reasonable to assume he would have received the minutes and the letters that were sent out in 1983. Um, he refers to having realised early on that HTLV3 could be transmitted by blood and blood products, as there was a high incidence in haemophilia patients, but he can't remember exactly when he became aware of that association. Um, um, he says in terms of responding to that risk that he didn't need to change his practice as he wasn't involved in starting patients on factor concentrates um, and did not operate on patients with haemophilia as distinct from patients with von Willebrand's disease who were treated with cryoprecipitate. He doesn't remember changing patients back to cryoprecipitate from concentrate. He says that would have been a decision taken by the Manchester Centre that he would have then have been implemented. Um, uh, in, in terms of uh, arrangements for testing patients, um, he, he has little um, recollection. In terms of HIV, he's aware of, he says, of one patient um, infected with HIV, but, but doesn't have any knowledge of whether there were any other patients or of numbers infected with hepatitis C. We don't have any data in terms of the material that the UK HCGO has recently provided to the inquiry in relation to um, cases in Blackburn, but there is a form from 1991, which is a list of age three forms submitted by centres um, to UK HCGO, and that does include one patient um, from um, centre uh, uh, 63, in other words, from Blackburn, um, who is recorded as having tested HIV positive in June of 1985. So that may be the one case um, uh, that Dr. Newsom is referring to, um, or, or may not. Um, he says he would have informed patients of results in, in any event in a face-to-face -face conversation. Um, he can't recall giving any patients a hepatitis C diagnosis, but says um, if he had done so, he would have done so, again, face-to-face. -face. 
arrangements for treatment of patients with hepatitis C he, he said, would, would have been largely um, either under the care of a gastroenterologist or, or being treated in Manchester. Um, so we do have an, a handful of witness statements from individuals who were treated at, at Blackburn. Um, there's a patient with mild von Willebrand's. Um, she received cryoprecipitate prophylactically in relation to a caesarean section. Um, she questioned the need for it at the time. She says she was not told of the risks. She was aware by 1987 um, of the risks of um, uh, certain risks associated with HIV. She believed that what she was receiving in terms of cryoprecipitate would have been heat treated, virally inactivated, and safe. Uh, she uh, was infected with hepatitis C. Um, there's another patient with Von Willebrand's um, who describes being treated both in Aberdeen and in Blackburn, infected with hepatitis C. Again, um, he says he was never told of the risks of, of treatment. A patient um, with severe haemophilia A, um, whose factor eight was consistent with Dr. Newsom's description, sent by Manchester to Blackburn to be picked up, was infected with hepatitis C, says no advice about risks was given to his parents. Uh, and then we have a statement from a patient with severe haemophilia B, infected with hepatitis C through factor nine, um, treated both at Blackburn and, and I think also Manchester Children's Hospital, uh, um, told that his mother was not told of the risks and, and indeed was, was reassured that this was a, a treatment that was safe. Um, and then there is a patient with severe von Willebrand's treated with cryoprecipitate, including at home. And that's a patient I referred to earlier who was a patient infected with HIV and hepatitis C and hepatitis B, uh, who also says that, that they were given no advice or information about risks. Um, in terms of um, the taking of blood samples, stored samples, Dr. Newsom's recollection is that samples were only ever taken as part of a clinical assessment, not taken for research, not aware of any samples being stored for prolonged periods, not aware of patients being tested for HIV or hepatitis without consent. Um, so that, that's um, a summary of the picture in relation to Blackburn. I'm going to move next, to, sir, to Sheffield Children's Hospital. You'll recall we've heard oral evidence about um, and have received further written evidence about um, uh, the uh, adult haemophilia centre. Um, the children's hospital um, operated as a haemophilia centre effectively in its own right. Prior to 1975, the consultant haematologist at the Sheffield Children's Hospital was Dr. Jeremy Geyer, but his principal interest was leukaemia. So for that early period, paediatric patients with bleeding disorders were primarily cared for by Professor Blackburn, um, who, who was the adult haematologist. But in 1975, Dr. Lilliman was appointed um, consultant haematologist at the Children's Hospital, uh, and um, he worked in that capacity until 1995. He was a member of UKHCDO over that period of time, and he's provided the inquiry with two statements, and much of the information I'm going to refer to is drawn from those statements. Um, both the documentary evidence and Dr. Lilliman's evidence suggests that there was a close relationship between the adult and children's uh, haemophilia centres with haematology trainees effectively doing rotations in relation to um, both. Um, uh, they were geographically close, and Dr. Lilliman says that um, we all met at least once a week for journal reviews and discussion of clinical problems. There was also a close relationship with the Regional Transfusion Centre under Dr. Wagstaff. Um, we'll explore the operation of the Transfusion Centre, hopefully in more detail in hearings um, later this year. Um, but Dr. Lilliman dis has described in his statement that Dr. Wagstaff, who was the director of the Regional Transfusion Centre, used to do a formal clinical session with him once a week when he came to help with the leukaemia clinic and Dr. Lilliman says that Dr. Wagstaff was a useful contact with a supply of blood products, in particular cryoprecipitate. Um, in terms of where products were obtained from for the Children's Hospital in Sheffield, Dr. Lilliman says there were, there were two sources. The first was direct from the blood transfusion service, fresh plasma uh, and cryoprecipitate. 
and, and those products will be delivered direct to the haematology department. Um, the second method in terms of procuring concentrates was via the Sheffield Children's Hospital uh, Pharmacy, which would order concentrate in turn via the um, pharmacy at the uh, uh, Hallamshire Hospital. Um, Dr. Lilliman says that the selection and purchase of blood products was a decision for the consultant haematologists, um, and he refers to regular informal meetings between the consultants at the um, Hallamshire and the uh, consultants um, at the Children's Hospital, as well as the wider discussions at UKHCDO meetings. Um, there were also, we know, blood transfusion director and haemophilia centre director meetings, um, which um, Dr. Lilliman occasionally attended. Um, uh, he says this in terms of his own approach. Um, my personal involvement in deciding on which factor concentrates to purchase was frequently to reiterate that for children who were small and required less factor eight per dose than adults, cryoprecipitate had many advantages. And for most admissions for joint bleeds, bumps and scrapes, heavy bruises and minor surgery was to be preferred, since it only exposed patients to a very small number of UK donors and reduced the risk of viral transmission that was becoming a recognised problem with large pooled vaccination processing. He describes cryoprecipitate as the treatment of choice at the children's hospital for all but the most serious bleeds or surgery, particularly after the problems of viral transmission of non-A, non-B hepatitis started to appear. He also refers to the use of tranexamic acid and DDAVP. Um, it, it is right to note, however, that the inquiry has evidence from mild haemophilia, uh, from a mild haemophilia A patient who was treated with factor uh, eight concentrates um, and was infected with hepatitis C as a result. Um, although Dr. Lineman in his statement very much focuses on cryoprecipitate, and we'll look at what the annual returns show in a moment, um, it is relevant to look at uh, a letter from him to Dr. Aaron Stam at Trelaws in 1979. Um, it's T R E L four zeros two three seven underscore zero six eight. Actually, sorry, there's a letter to similar effect that's easier to read. T R E L five zeros nine zero underscore zero three two, please. Sorry, Janet. So this is a letter from Dr. Lilliman to Dr. Aaron Stam in September 1979. It's in relation to a particular pupil or patient. Um, refers to self-therapy in, in the first paragraph. And then it says, the material that we use subject to availability is the Lister concentrate, but we also use commercial concentrates, chiefly factor eight by Armour Pharmaceuticals to make up any shortfalls in supply. Uh, and then indicates that they'll be happy to provide such materials for the individual patient um, during the school holidays. Um, in terms of uh, product usage, the best guide um, to what products were actually used is probably the annual returns. If we start with 1979, we don't have a 78 return, HCDO 301367. Um, we can see here 23 haemophilic patients two with antibodies, five Christmas disease patients. And then in terms of the product usage, cryoprecipitate, 76,000, looks like 580. NHS concentrate, 115,492. So that's the largest amount used. But then a not insignificant amount of factor eight, 38,850. And then a smaller amount of cryobulin, 10,076. And then you'll see that factor, uh, NHS factor nine concentrate was used uh, for the Christmas disease patients and in relation to other materials referenced to, to feeble or fibre. Um, then if we go to 1980, 
um, HCDO three zeros one four six five. Um, we can see 20 patients, um, haemophilia A patients treated, one von Willebrands. And then if we look at the product usage, um, for the von Willebrands patient, perhaps somewhat surprisingly, we see no treatment with cryoprecipitate, but um, treatment with factor VIII, the armor product. For the haemophilia A patients, a very modest amount comparatively of cryoprecipitate um, a much larger amount of NHS factor concentrate used for home uh, treatment. Ha have we attempted to convert the bags I into units? Ah, no, I should do that. Bef yes, you're right, sir. That is bags, not units, isn't it? Um, I'm not sure whether, they, whether we have anything which indicates a standard approach from Sheffield, because ordinarily the figures are given as, as units or sometimes as bottles, etc., um, in the previous return, 1,094 1, bottles was 76,000 odd units. I'm going to rely upon either. So, in, in which case, is about one and a half times that for, for this? Yes. So, what, what were the units before? So, what, just over 1,000, it's referred to as bottles, but it was probably bags, um, was 76,580 units. Yes. So we might be looking at something over 100,000 units, in fact. Well, it's, uh, it's certainly going to be that, isn't it? Yeah. It's uh, going to be roughly, uh, yes, 110. Yes, you're absolutely right. Used in hospital. Um, so perhaps a not dissimilar amount to the amount of NHS concentrate used, 113,495 for home treatment, and then a much smaller amount in hospital. Um, and then we can see factor eight being used, the armour product, 12,000 dollars for home treatment, 504 um, units uh, in hospital, uh, and a smallish amount also of cryobulin used in hospital, um, 4,340. Uh, and then um, over the page tells us that there were four haemophilia B patients treated with NHS factor nine. I mean, what, what, it, what it appears to show is that the, the treatment in hospital was very heavily weighted in favor of cryo, and obviously at home, um, it, it was the other way around. Yes. Well, there wasn't any cryo used at home. And then if we go to 1981, HCDO 301566, um, 20 patients treated with haemophilia A, none with von Willebrand's, um, if we zoom in on the figure for cryoprecipitate, I think we've, we've got then bags, 1,344, but someone's written in what looks like roughly 94,000, which, which again sounds yes. roughly right. Um, so hospital treatment, again, weighted towards cryoprecipitate, and then home treatment weighted towards NHS concentrate, um, 178,750 there. And then you can see um, just over 9,000 units being used of factor eight the armor product, but a significantly larger volume of cryobulin used that year. So 104,698 units used for hospital treatment. So commercial concentrate usage has, um, has increased um, fairly significantly in 1981. The 1982 return. Just a, a matter of, of curiosity. Um, shortly before this, uh, there had been um, a, a price list from Immuno, which had priced uh, cryobulin at two, two different prices, depending on whether it came from American plasma or American source plasma or, or from European plasma. Um, so, the if you if you want to read, if you if it's appropriate to read, the European is as equivalent to the sort of donor base that would feed the NHS if that's appropriate, um, then uh, it, it, it broadly is in the NHS class, if you like, in terms of uh, the, uh, the donor base that was feeding into it. Uh, do we have any sense as to which, if either, um, uh, the cryobulin was in this case? 
No, I don't think we do. I don't recall any particular interactions with pharmaceutical companies which would shed any light upon that. So um, we can check, but I don't think so. Um, if we go to 1982 then, um, uh, HCDO 301664, um, 19 patients with haemophilia A, two with von Willebrand's. It looks as though the von Willebrand's patients were treated exclusively with DDAVP. Um, Cryoprecipitate usage is solely in hospital. We're told 971 bags. Someone's written in 67,970 in terms of units. Um, NHS factor concentrate is the bulk of the, well, is, is the sole treatment for home treatment, 136,100. And then a smaller amount, 17,535 in hospital. Um, no commercial products um, there recorded. The only other um, treatment recorded is, is autoplex towards the bottom of the page uh, and then um, again as, as is normal um, um, we see the haemophilia B patients on page 3 being treated with NHS factor 9 concentrate um, and then if we go to 1983 um, HCDO Four zeros, one three nine underscore zero zero four. Seventeen patients with haemophilia A treated. Um, again, we, we see cryoprecipitate used in hospital. One thousand one hundred thirty-five bags. They're translated as, by somebody at least as seventy-nine thousand four hundred eighty units. The predominant treatment for home treatment is NHS concentrate, 147,622, and then a small amount of factor eight being used both in hospital and for home treatment. Um, and then we can see autoplex as well um, towards the bottom of the page. Um, then for 1984, HCDO 301854, We can see 17 patients treated with haemophilia A, three with von Willebrand's. Um, and again, there are no commercial um, factor eight concentrates recorded. Um, so the, the predominant um, usage for cryoprecipitate is um, uh, hospital uh, treatment, 79,030 units, it would appear, with a small amount being used for home treatment. So well, that, now, that's interesting. Yes. So there's been... Um because previously we haven't had for some time, we haven't had cryoprecipitate used at home. That's correct. So yes, um, a move to that in 1984. Um, and NHS factor concentrate then being the bulk of the product used for home treatment, 168,820 units. So in, in the last, uh, in the early 80s, the, the uh, amount of commercial concentrate used is reduced very, uh, it wasn't high, but from a, a low basis reduced even further. Um, the use of cryoprecipitate is broadly maintained, drops a little bit, uh, but it starts to be used, it, perhaps just in one case, I don't know, for, for home treatment. Um, a, and the main focus is on cryoprecipitate in hospital uh, and uh, NHS concentrate uh, for home. That's right. Uh, a small amount of autoplex at the bottom, and then for von Willebrand's cryoprecipitate and DDAVP. Do, do we have any, any explanation as to whether this represented a change in response to, um, to any perception of risk? I, I don't think so. Um, I mean, Dr. Lilliman, I'll come on to, to Dr. Lilliman's knowledge of risk, but he, he's pretty clear in his witness statement that he recognised from an early stage um, that uh, um, there were risks of viral transmission in blood products and hence he had a preference for cryoprecipitate um, and then for NHS concentrate over commercial concentrates. Uh, and uh, did he say anything about, so far as commercial concentrate was concerned, sticking with the one batch? 
Um, I'll have to double check that. Um, uh, no, he, he used it to a fairly limited extent, and um, it's very rare, I think, to see, I'll have to double check back through the returns, um, a year in which there is more than one type of commercial concentrate in any of those. Yes. Um, that was when the, the immuno was, was being used. There may have been some special reason for that. Yes, that's possible. I don't think we know the answer to that. Um, in any event, that's 1984. Uh, and then um, if we just finally look at 1985, at HCDO 3010948, um, it's a very similar position. Um, it may, of course, have been that the NHS factor concentrate was, at, at some point during the year, heat-treated. 20 haemophilia A patients, one von Willebrand's. Um, the sole treatment for the von Willebrand's patient is recorded as DDAVP. And then in terms of the haemophilia A patients, we can see what's said to be 77,000 units of cryoprecipitate used um, in hospital. Um, again, there's cryoprecipitate for home treatment. It looks like 24,500. Um, no, actually, that might be 2,450 units. Um, and then for the NHS factor uh, 8 concentrate, the bulk of it for home treatment, 174,520, but 43,655 used in hospital. And then we can see use of high HC and autoplex at the bottom of the page. Um, so... Th that's the, the data from the returns, which is broadly consistent um, with um, the narrative account given by Dr. Lilliman in his witness statement. Um, he, he's also clear in his statement, and, and this won't be surprising given the evidence that the inquiry's heard to date, um, that there was a particular interest in Sheffield um, in non-A, non-B hepatitis. So he says here, we in Sheffield realised pretty early on that there was a potential problem of virus transfer in blood products used for haemophilia since non-A, non-B hepatitis was already recognised as a problem following the observation that abnormal liver function tests were not an infrequent finding in both adults and young boys with severe haemophilia. And he refers to um, the study from the Children's Hospital published in 1980. We've, we've looked at it on previous occasions. It's, it's the McGrath study co-ordered by um, um, uh, Dr Lilliman, um, Dr uh, Trigger, Trigger and Dr Underwood, liver disease complicating severe haemophilia in childhood. And he says that that study reinforced the view at the Children's Hospital that cryoprecipitate was a safer product than factor VIII and says we therefore use this product in preference to factor VIII concentrate for routine treatment for all but major surgery in young boys. Um, uh, um, that is probably as clear a piece of information about Dr Lilliman's own um, knowledge of risk as, as one might require. Um, but he also attended UK HCDO meetings at which um, hepatitis and in particular Dr Krask's um, presentations uh, were discussed. Um, uh, he attended um, um, again at the meeting in November 1979 uh, in which uh, Dr. Krask again gave a further presentation about hepatitis and non-A, non-B hepatitis, as did Professor Blackburn and Dr. Preston from the um, Adult Haemophilia uh, Centre. Um, we can also um, um, see uh, it's at ULHT 601. Um, a letter um, from Dr. Lilliman, March 1979. Um, it looks like it's to a parents of a particular patient, and it's about liver biopsies. So again, consistent with the study that was being undertaken and the particular interest. Um, he says, um, I will restate our reasons for suggesting that, the, the name is redacted, should have a liver biopsy. Since the introduction of factor VIII concentrates for the treatment of haemophilia, it has been noted that quite a few haemophiliacs, both adults and children, have developed abnormalities of their liver function as tested from blood samples. Liver biopsies have recently been performed in some of these patients here in Sheffield and in other centres, and most show evidence of underlying chronic liver disease. The severity of the liver disease is quite variable. Most show only mild changes which do not require further treatment except observation. However, occasional patients do show quite marked liver changes, and consideration is then given to further treatment, usually with steroids. 
um, it then refers back to the individual patient and says that they have for the past five months shown abnormalities of his liver function in blood tests. We would therefore like to know the extent of any changes in his liver cells to decide whether he requires any further treatment and to help us to understand the nature of the relatively new problem. Um, and then talks a little more about the process in terms of undertaking a biopsy. Um, so that, that's hepatitis. As I say, the picture in Sheffield really is very clear. In terms of um, uh, HIV AIDS, Dr. Lineman in his statement says this. My first inkling of HIV was at a childhood leukemia meeting in London in 1981, where we learned of a rare lung infection, PCP, being found in five young previously healthy gay men in Los Angeles. This was of interest because children on chemotherapy for acute leukemia are also susceptible to this rare condition because of immunosuppression. By the end of 1981, there were 270 reported cases of severe immunodeficiency among gay men in the USA, and 121 of them had died. In June of 1982, the disease was reported in American haemophiliacs. In September, the CDC used the term AIDS to describe the disease. I first became aware of the association between AIDS and blood products around the time when the matter was raised at the UK HCDO in September of 1982. Um, two other documents um, showing um, Dr. Lilliman's attendance at meetings in 1983 First of all, PARA 5013. This is a document we looked at with Dr. Parapia, if you recall, Hemostasis Club meeting, March the 8th, 1983, and there's a discussion about AIDS. Um, if we go back to the full page... There's a reference to, so we can go to the next page. So there's an update about the data in relation to AIDS. Um, and then I think it's on the third page. Yes, there's a reference then um, um, to um, Dr. Linneman at present looking at T4 and T8 cell ra ratios um, in um, uh, uh, um, these patients. That was um, a particular trial of patients. Um, uh, haemophiliacs and normals. Um, and then if we go to BSHA 605 underscore 049. Um, this is a meeting of a committee of the British Society for Haematology. This is the 4th of October 1983. We can see the attendees include Dr. Shinton, um, Dr. Bellingham, Dr. Lilliman, Dr. Colvin, Dr. Hardesty, Professor Bloom, Dr. Dawson, and um, Dr. Delamore. Um, there's a discussion about a number of matters, but if we go to the last page of the document, we can see that the British Society for Haematology are proposing to set up an AIDS working party specifically in relation to the practice of haematology in the diagnostic laboratory. Um, Dr. Ritzer and Dr. Bloom are two of the four members of that working party, the others being Dr. Pinching and Dr. Jeffries. Um, uh, so, um, uh, uh, again, we, can, we, we see, as it were, um, AIDS on the haematology agenda um, in the course of 1983. Um, uh, uh, um, and uh, through his attendance at UK CDO meetings, his discussions with his colleagues in Sheffield, it can, I think, fairly be taken that Dr. Lilliman um, was familiar with the discussions that were taking place at, at the UK CDO level. Um, in terms of the arrangements for testing patients, um, his evidence to the inquiry, this is for HTLV3, I think we did not rush to mass HIV testing for our patients who'd only received cryoprecipitate or NHS factor VIII. I cannot remember that we did. For any that wanted reassurance, we would have agreed and discussed with the parents what the process involved and what a positive result would mean. But I cannot recall any positive results in our haemophiliac boys up to the time I left, which was 1995. So his recollection and his statement was, was he couldn't recall any positive cases of HIV. The, the data we've received, the provisional data from UKHCDO, also doesn't record any positive cases of, of HIV in Sheffield Children's Hospital patients. But 
there is a document which suggests that one patient did test positive. Um, if we go to RHAL 40485. Um, so uh, we're not quite sure who, who scribbled this, but it says from section entitled Dr. Tedder Sample Sheffield Children's Hospital. If we go to page three, it's then a letter from, from Dr. Preston to Dr. Lineman. I've now received the results of the samples which he sent us recently, and I enclose a copy herewith. And then um, the, the samples if we are negative until we get to page 8. And, and you'll see, we've obviously redacted the names, but there's one um, uh, patient there identified as testing positive. Um, we don't have any more information specifically from the children's hospital, um, but I can indicate, because obviously the inquiry has access to the unredacted versions of these documents, that is... A, a name of a patient who we know from other material was infected with HIV. Um, and we have some um, evidence from a family member and are expecting more evidence from a family member which might cast further light upon the circumstances of infection. Um, but so, we, so contrary to, to Dr. Lineman's recollection and the UK HCDO data, there does appear to be some evidence at least of a, of a children's hospital patient um, um, one children's hospital patient testing positive for HIV. Yes. Um, in terms so th this is a, a pretty clear distinction between Sheffield uh, and the other centres we've been considering. Yes. It, it, the distinction, um, if we're talking in particular about children, may become even clearer when we look at Alderhay. Um, and Trelaws. Yes. Um, uh, and the children, um, do we know in the case of Sheffield um, what age they transferred? Do you, did you tell us during the Sheffield presentation? Do you remember? We didn't have a presentation on Sheffield, as I recall. We had evidence from Dr. Preston we had and some from, from Mr. Professor from, Hay. From, uh, we had evidence from Preston. We did, Hay. and we've got a long written statement from Dr. Macris, and we had some oral evidence from, from Professor Hay. Um, I cannot recall off the top of my head. I, I think we probably do know. Um, um, I, I mean, the, I seem to recall the point of transfer being at, at roughly mid-teens or late, late teens. Well, in, in other places, it tended to be about 16, 17. Yes. I don't recall it being anything different from that, but I, I will double-check, sir. So to put it in, uh, that may be necessary to put it in context, but it's, um, yes. Um, uh, um, in, in terms of hepatitis C, Professor, Lin sorry, Dr. Lineman was unable to recall when the centre began testing for hepatitis C. He himself left in, in 1995. Um, but it, in fact, the evidence we have from individuals treated at the Sheffield Children's Hospital with factor products prior to the, to the second half of the 80s, was that their diagnosis of hepatitis C commonly occurred at other centres because they had, by that time, by the early 1990s, they had transitioned to adult care. And so they were being diagnosed with hepatitis C and informed of them at other centres. So th there isn't a, um, in anything which emerges in particular from the documentation which casts any light upon um, the infection of Sheffield Children's Hospital patients with hepatitis C. There is some material... Um, from the hepatitis C litigation from the late 90s showing cases where the defendant was the Sheffield Children's Hospital, but they appear to be cases relating to transfusion um, rather than um, um, uh, uh, the treatment of patients um, with blood products. Um, we'll explore um, the position in relation to Trelaws obviously next week in common with a, with a lot of other centres that treated children, 
th there is correspondence between Trelaws and the Children's Hospital in relation to individuals who were pupils at Trelaws and treated at Trelaws during the um, term time and, and were then um, transitioned back during holidays to the care of the Children's Hospital. Um, and Do Dr Lilliman has said that he, he didn't determine what treatment was provided to patients at Trelaws. That was determined um, by Trelaws. Um, he says that we had no control over their choice of therapeutic products. Um, he, he, he says in his statement, um, by 1980, I was becoming concerned about hepatitis. And since I had no control on which products were used with Trelaws boys, they were more exposed to American factor eight. Um, in 1976, he's talking there about a particular case. This would not have been virally inactivated. Um, he, he refers to, to using a, a commercial product, Profilate, um, in a serious problem with a Trelaws boy at home on holiday where there was a life-threatening head injury. Um, uh, uh, he says the concept of a special residential school for boys with haemophilia was a brave and exciting experiment. It gave the pupils a greater chance of not missing school because of hospital trips and to mingle with peers who had similar problems. Um, and at... Um, T-R-E-L 40237-072. We can see a letter Dr. Lilliman wrote um, commending um, Trelaws uh, um, it's right to note this is August 1975 so this is before the point in time in his statement where he says by 1980 I was increasingly concerned about the risks. But he says here, um, a third paragraph, the best place in the country, probably the world, for haemophiliac schoolboys is the Lord Mayor Trelaw School in Hampshire. This is the only place where treatment is available on the premises, no trips to hospital, and there are already about um, 80 other severe haemophiliacs there. Um, uh, and he describes it as being a, a marvellous opportunity um, for um, the uh, individual. Um, Last point in relation to Sheffield Children's Hospital and um, Trelaws is um, th there was a study run by Dr. Kirk at Trelaws in which Dr. Linneman had some involvement, um, but he says this about it. The proposed Trelaw hepatitis study was an attempt to look at the incidence of hepatitis in a cohort of boys who were restricted to one type of factor eight over a period of time to see whether the incidence and type of hepatitis differed from that of other cohorts restricted to other factor eight sources, that is different factor eight concentrates. My contribution was an offer to restrict our boys at home in Sheffield to cryoprecipitate for treatment, with a proviso that we would obviously have to break protocol and give a concentrated form of factor eight for serious or life-threatening bleeds. So his intent, his, his, his perspective of involvement was, was he, he, he would offer the perspective of treatment with cryoprecipitate um, um, uh, for the purposes of the study. Um, so, so that's the Sheffield Children's Hospital. Um, and uh, I would say D Dr. Lilliman's statement is, is, is an interesting and useful one. And, and, and I know, sir, you've read it, but um, uh, uh, others may find it of, of, of great interest. Um, I'm going to turn next to um, the Haemophilia Centre in Leeds, based at St. James's Hospital. The, the um, centre director, the sole centre director from around 1970 was Dr. Swinburne. She was joined by Dr. McVerry in 1985. Um, he, um, he moved from Liverpool, and I'll be looking at Liverpool sh um, shortly, uh, um, but he moved from Liverpool um, to Leeds, and they were joint directors um, until 1992 when Dr. Swinburne retired. And then Dr. McVerry was the sole director until his retirement in 2011. Um, the, the documentary evidence we have in relation to Leeds is, is, is not um, terribly illuminating. Uh, we'll, we'll, obviously look at the annual returns, which are helpful. Um, but in terms of other contemporaneous documents, they, they don't paint a very clear picture. We do have some limited evidence from Dr. Swinburne. 
And we have some statements from Dr. McVeary, and so some of what I say will be drawn from that. Dr. Swinburne recalls the centre having its own lab in which um, they prepared cryoprecipitate. Um, Dr. McVeary recalls when he joined the centre um, there was a nurse, um, there wasn't a specialist haemophilia registrar. In, in terms of the allocation of responsibilities from 1985 onwards, as between Dr. McVeary and Dr. Swinburne, Dr. McVeary's recollection is that he focused on the adult patients and Dr. Swinburne took responsibility for the children um, from that point. Um, uh, and then he says, it's, uh, I think all the evidence suggests at some point between 1985 and 1991, he took over the management of um, uh, uh, various aspects of um, uh, uh, clinical care, including haemophilia. There was also a social work service possibly established in the late 1980s um, under a social worker called Sheila O'Rourke. Um, if we then look at a handful of documents... So, um, if we start with DHSC... 302359 underscore 046, please. We pick up the position in 1975. Um, this is a letter from Dr. Tovey, Director of the Regional Transfusion Centre in Leeds, to Dr. Maycock at the DHSS. But um, picking it up in the first paragraph, four lines down, the largest user of cryoprecipitate is the Leeds Haemophilia Centre, and they've insisted for years on making their own cryo from fresh frozen plasma supplied by us. Um, and he refers to the issuing of fresh frozen plasma donations, which they turned into cryoprecipitate. So that reflects um, what Dr. Swinburne recalled. Um, I won't go to the next document we've referred to in the note, but there's evidence from... Um, uh, uh, a meeting that Dr. Swinburne attended, a local haemophilia society meeting, um, that by 1974, there was a home treatment programme um, of some kind established. And that's consistent with evidence we've received from um, a patient who recalls commencing home treatment in or around 1974. If we then look at... Um, ARMO 5013. This is a letter dated the 18th of May 1977 from Arma Pharmaceutical to the Committee on the Safety of Medicines. And we can see in the first paragraph it refers to having received reports from three centres of clinical jaundice occurring in haemophilia patients who've received um, our drug Factor VIII, and Leeds is one of the hospitals. Um, um, they're identified, uh, and um, uh, so it's clear that, that as at 1977, uh, Leeds must have been using the armour product in, in part at least, uh, and was aware of clinical jaundice in some cases. We also know from other documents that in the course of 1977, um, the hospital used, or the centre used, coate. The first return we have is from 1978. And if we go to HCDO 301271, and we're going to see in these returns a marked contrast to, by way of example, the centre we've just looked at, because we see commercial concentrate being um, the predominant um, product. So a large number of patients treated, 84 haemophilic patients, uh, 10 uh, Christmas disease patients. And then if we look at the treatment, um, cryoprecipitate and limited usage would appear by 1978, 5,000 units. NHS concentrate, 590,335 units. The armour product, factor eight, 862,053 units. And then cryobulin, 115,981 units, and then NHS factor nine used for the Christmas disease haemophilia, haemophilia B patients. Um, and if we look 
at um, page five. This is just by way of example um, that we've got a number of these pages, but we can see patients there identified as receiving um, more than one type of concentrate. So the top line shows a patient receiving the L3 factor eight and factor eight and cryobulin. And, and, uh, and then there, there are others for whom there are those three ticks, some also receiving cryoprecipitate. There are some who receive, on, receive only NHS concentrate and a commercial one. Um, this page has one example of a patient who receives only NHS concentrate. It's a not dissimilar picture. Um, if we look, for example, at page four, Again, you can see from the number of ticks, there are some patients receiving, um, uh, for example, only NHS concentrate, some who receive cryo and L3 and ARMA and cryobulin, um, and so on. So th th there doesn't appear to be uh, um, any kind of policy in place of restricting patients to one type of product, um, still less any um, policy of, of batch dedication. We don't have the 1979 or 1980 returns. Um, we do know if we look at MHRA 5083 underscore 011. Um, that in 1980, Dr. Swinburne received direct from Armour some vials of a batch of high potency factor eight. So the first paragraph says, we're supplying with this letter 49 vials of the above batch um, of our dried human anti-hemophilic fraction. This batch has not yet been released by the DHSS, but they've agreed that the material can be forwarded to you because it's urgently required to meet patient need. Uh, we cannot accept any responsibility if the lot is subsequently not released by the DHSS. Um, the next document we have which casts any, any particular light on product usage is the 1981 return, HCDO 3081536. Again, we can see it's a large centre, 90 haemophilia A patients treated, six von Willebrand's disease patients treated. Um, uh, no crow precipitate used except for von Willebrand's disease patients. In terms of NHS concentrate, a significant volume used um, in hospital, 592,070, and then 52,750 for home treatment. And then a, a significant amount of the armor factor eight product used, so 1,630,256 units for home treatment. Um, just over 162,000 or a little over 162,000 for hospital treatment. So commercial products, now only one type of commercial product for this year, but very much predominating um, in, in terms of product um, usage. Well, it's, it's roughly three times as much yes. um, uh, as, as the NHS. Um, and then if we go to 1982, Two HCDO three zeros one six three five. Ninety eight patients with haemophilia A treated, um, uh, um, and eight von Willebrand's patients treated. Um, we can see no cryo used for haemophilia A patients, um, no NHS concentrate used for home treatment, but four hundred and four um, 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 plus used in hospital um, and then a huge amount of factor eight being used so 2.29 million units of factor eight used for home treatment um, a smaller amount 64,485 used for hospital treatment um, there's reference to um, a small amount of porcine factor eight treatment being used um, and then if we look across to the von Willebrand's patients we see there um, um, von Willebrand's patients being treated with cryoprecipitate, with NHS concentrate, um, and with, um, in, in smaller measure, with the um, armor product, the factor eight. 
uh, again, I won't go to the page, but for haemophilia B patients, it's, it's the, the consistent picture of NHS factor IX concentrate. So for the haemophilia A patients here, the, the ratio is, has moved up in a year from having been three to one commercial to NHS to, to somewhere between four and five yes. to, to one. That's right. Um, if we then go, it's 1982... Oh. 1983 is HCDO3 0 17341. Um, 92 haemophilia A patients, 8 von Willebrand's patients. Um, we can see here the proportion of, of NHS concentrate has increased. So hospital is 571,980, home 877,980. Um, but um, we still then have a, a significant volume of the armour product, small amount in hospital, 23,285, 1.642 million units used for home treatment, um, and then um, a, a small amount of um, fibre or fibre and porcine or bovine product. Um, and then for von Willebrand's, again, a m very small amount of plasma, cryoprecipitate, NHS concentrate, and armour product um, used for treatment of von Willebrand's. Um, so uh, there is there a significant increase in NHS concentrate, but armour remains the predominant treatment. Um, we don't have um, the return for 1984, unfortunately. If we pick the picture up in 1985 at HCDO 301920, We see the, that Dr. Swinburne's been joined by Dr. McVerry as director. A number of haemophilia A patients treated 83. Von Willebrand's patients treated 9. Um, and then um, we can see, uh, and again, there will no doubt have been some use of heat-treated product during the course of that, that calendar year. Um, tiny amount of cryoprecipitate used. And then NHS concentrate, 336,466 in hospital, 717,000 for home treatment. Uh, we see profilate being used in 1985, 84,000-odd uh, hospital, 514,026 for home treatment. Uh, and then continued heavy reliance upon the armour product, factor eight, 385,000-odd in hospital, 1.699 million for home treatment. Um, again, a small amount of fibre. We, we don't see DDABP um, listed on, I should say, on, on, on these returns. Um, um, the significance of that might become apparent if we look at the 1986 return, HCDO 302017. I'm not going to go through the details of the treatment in 1986, but if we look at the bottom of the page we'll see DDAVP there recorded for the first time. Um, we, we don't have any other documents which cast any particular light on treatment policies or approach. We, we just have really the, the fairly stark data that appears from the returns. Um, in, in relation to knowledge of risk of hepatitis and AIDS, both Dr. Swinburne and Dr. McVerry were regular attenders of UK HCDO meetings. Dr. Swinburne has said she, um, to the, in her statement to the inquiry she also gained information from smaller local meetings, some of which she organised. By way of example, in terms of attendance at meetings, Dr. Swinburne attended the directors' meeting, so the Haemophilia Centre directors' meeting in April 1971, at which Dr. Biggs' work on jaundice was discussed. She attended the 1972 meeting at which Dr. Biggs provided an update on her work. She attended the 1974 meeting when Dr. Crask reported on the hepatitis outbreak in Bournemouth amongst patients who'd received commercial factor eight. We've looked at all the meeting minutes in earlier hearings, so I'm not going to go to the underlying documents. She attended the 1975 meeting at which there was a presentation on the study on jaundice and a discussion about hepatitis, liver function tests and pool sizes. She attended the 1977 meeting at which Dr. Crask reported on his study of hepatitis in haemophilic patients receiving haemophil. 
both Dr Swinburne and Dr McVerry, the latter was there representing a, a different centre, attended the 1978 meeting at which Dr Crask presented the report of the Hepatitis Working Party. Um, it, it appears likely that both attended the September 1980 meeting. Dr McVerry at that stage would have been there in his capacity as director for Liverpool at which Dr. Krask discussed various liver biopsy studies being undertaken at the Royal Free and Sheffield, and it was recorded that first-time exposure to large pooled factor VIII concentrates resulted in many cases of hepatitis. And we know that that Glasgow Symposium on Unresolved Problems in Haemophilia took place, um, uh, I think, immediately following the director's meeting. Both Dr. Swinburne and Dr. Maveri were at the October 81 director's meeting where Dr. Krask presented a pre-circulated report on hepatitis. And just pausing there, it is apparent from a number of the minutes um, that um, Dr. Krask's reports were provided to directors in advance of the meetings. Um, um, so presumably those who didn't attend the meetings would nonetheless have received the reports. Um, and there was a discussion at that meeting about chronic hepatitis and living, liver disease. They both attended the September 82 meeting at which the issue of AIDS was raised and Dr. Krask asked directors to let him know if there had been any cases of the syndrome. They would presumably both have received Dr. Mary, Dr. McVerry then in his capacity at Liverpool, Dr. Swinburne at Leeds, the March 83 letter in enclosures from Dr. Krask um, with the update on AIDS and the criteria for reporting cases. Dr. McVerry was at the October 83 meeting, that one in which Dr. Chisholm raised her concern um, about um, AIDS and discussed reversion to cryoprecipitate. Um, and they both, um, McVerry and Swinburne, attended the September 84 director's meeting. Dr. McVerry has also told us in his um, statement to the inquiry that he read the British Journal of Hematology, the Lancet, Blood, and the New England Journal of Medicine. He thought he would have read Professor Preston's 1978 Lancet publication, which we've looked at on a number of occasions. But he, it's right to say, he says in his statement, in the late 70s, early 80s, he says, we did not know what caused non-A, non-B hepatitis or that it could be serious. Um, in terms of testing for HTLV3 at Leeds, the picture, um, again, from the documents is not entirely clear. Um, there is evidence of patients being tested. Um, uh, well, the earliest result we can see is November 1984. In fact, if we just go to uh, me. OXUH302221, If we look at the very top of the page, we'll see it says AIDS-3 forms, so those are the UK HCDO forms or PHLS forms, received by the 28th of August 1991. Um, and then if we go back to the screen, you'll see there's a heading for centre. Um, um, and if we go over the page, if we zoom in towards the middle of the page, there's, yes, there's a reference there to centre 049, that's Leeds, and we can see here an example of a patient who's first tested positive for HIV in January of 1985. Um, I'm not going to go through the detail of it, but what, but what we can see from that is, is there were patients um, uh, um, who have tested positive for HIV in early 1985. There are references to test results in January, in February of 1985. Um, uh, there are references to test results in April of 1985. The earliest we can see, there are two from 1984. We don't need to look at the individual entries. There's one from November, late November 84. There's one from late December 84. Um, and then there is one, I think, there's one from March 85. Um, some more from March 85, um, um, and then there's one from 1986. So perhaps we should go to this. It's page 32, please show me. So if we look, it's, that, that's great. So if we look just above um, 
the heading halfway down the page, AIDS ARC, case, ARC deaths reported. Just above that, you'll see an entry surface, centre 049. And if we read across, we can see the last HIV negative was February 1985, first HIV positive, December 1986. So what it appears to show is a process of HIV testing beginning in late 1984, continuing through the early part of 1985. Um, uh, this is a late zero conversion, potentially, um, uh, well, whether from unheated or from heat-treated product, um, I, I think we, we, we won't know. Um, Dr. McVery cannot recall, in terms of leads, we, so we can take that down, thank you, Shumik, whether patients were advised that they were being tested for um, HIV. The inquiry has received evidence from witnesses who say that they were tested without being told. Um, for example, there's a witness who has seen from her medical records suggestions that she was, uh, her, her um, bloods were tested on three occasions be in between 86 and 87, and, and she wasn't herself ever told um, of those tests taking place. Um, there's evidence from an inquiry witness about a meeting being held in the lecture theatre at St James's Hospital. The recollection is that that takes place in the summer of 1986, at which there's a public discussion about HIV. There's another witness who's given evidence to the inquiry that they weren't informed of their HIV status until three years after the diagnosis. Dr Swinburne, in her brief statement to the inquiry, has said that they were as transparent as they could be with patients. Dr. McVeary says that patients would have been informed of their diagnosis in person. Um, it's right to note that there's the parent of a patient of Dr. Swinburne described being informed of her son's HIV status at a routine checkup. Um, the data we have in terms of numbers infected, if we go to INQY 40250. This is the same table um, that we looked at um, earlier, so it's subject to all the same qualifications that this is. This is provisional data. It represents um, our analysis of material provided to the inquiry by UKHCDA. But if we go to page three, we can see Leeds is centre 49. And we see recorded there six patients um, who's um, uh, uh, tested positive in 1984, 42 in 1985, and five in 1986. 53 patients uh, infected with HTLV3, and um, that data suggests. We, we don't have figures about the numbers infected with hepatitis C, sir. Dr. McVeary. Um, recollection was that verbal consent was obtained from patients in relation to hepatitis C testing. Um, there is evidence, again, that the inquiry has received from individuals, which suggests that there were delays between tests being undertaken and patients being told their results. Um, others have said that they were informed of their results uh, um, of being infected with hepatitis C at routine appointments or informally. Um, some describe a lack of information provided to them about hepatitis C um, and, and it not being clearly explained. Um, Dr. McVeary says that in the time he was at the centre in Leeds, um, they, the centre sought to work with the hospital's liver and infectious disease unit in terms of the treatment of those with hepatitis um, and would seek their input when required. Um, so, sir, um, in relation to Leeds, um, uh, what we have is a clear picture of the products that were used from the annual returns with very significant amounts of commercial concentrates. There's no evidence of any particular risk reduction or minimisation strategy. Um, there is some limited evidence about the process of testing and diagnosis. Um, and in relation to um, how results were communicated, what information was provided, 
your best guide again may be the evidence that the inquiry has received from individuals who were infected or their family members. Uh, so I'm about to move to Royal Liverpool, um, both in light of the time and to give my voice a break. Um, take the break now. Yes, well, I think, I think you probably think deserve one minutes, now. So. Um, shall, we, shall we come back uh, then at uh, 25 to uh, 4? That's fine. So I should say um, I may not complete Alderhay today. There's a lot of information about Royal Liverpool and Alderhay that um, really shouldn't be taken too quickly. Um, so it may be that Alderhay will be... Uh, I might get it started today, but, but we don't finish it till tomorrow morning. I well, do not want to rush the picture that emerges from the data we have there. Yes, well, for, for those who have an interest in, in Alderhay, then they, they can expect that... Uh, at some point, some convenient point uh, this evening, we, we'll break and, and hear it fresh in the, the rest of it fresh in the morning. Yes. 